Stephen Hawking once said, "We are just an advanced breed of monkeys on a minor planet of a very average star, but we can understand the universe, and that makes us something very special." You know what else makes me special? This here electronic engineering podcast. Hey, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi there, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and hosted by me, Amelia Dalton. So recently, I asked a friend of mine if you could go anywhere with money not at issue or the current state of the world, where would you go? And he said, "The moon, duh." So, in honor of my friend Chris, let's head up into space. But how are we going to get there? NASA? Yeah, that's kind of a long game, right? <laughs> Space adventures? Haven't heard about them in a while, so、uh, probably not. And that leaves good old SpaceX. And folks, they are keeping your comfort in mind. Oh yes. <laughs> so SpaceX has just released a new version of its spacecraft user manual for the Starship, a next-generation launch vehicle that's currently under development in Boca Chica, Texas. So this isn't the first spacecraft manual published by SpaceX, and it's definitely not as detailed as their other aircraft manuals. But it does give us a whole lot of juicy details about how the Starship is going to be used, its high-capacity cargo hauler, and how we are all going to go to the moon in style. Okay, so let's start with that cargo hauler. So, what exactly are we talking about hauling here? Well, satellites to begin with. The Starship has the capacity to send up a full constellation of satellites at a time, or three geosynchronous telecom satellites, or even a combination of one or two large geosynchronous satellites with a couple more rideshare small satellites along for the ride. So, get this. SpaceX says that the Starship will be able to carry even more stuff into space, even beyond its cargo hold, with the addition of payloads attached to the nose and the side walls of the spacecraft itself, which was only previously possible with the space shuttle. And also, like the space shuttle, and unlike any other operational launch vehicles out there today, the Starship will also be able to recover satellites in orbit, repair them in space, or send them back to Earth if needed, and even move them to a different target orbit entirely. So, another part of the SpaceX Starship cargo plan is what they call in-space demonstration spacecraft. So this demo spacecraft is actually going to be attached to the Starship, and will help conduct missions, carry out experiments, and return back to Earth. Yes, just like on the episode Galileo, when Spock takes over the shuttle and then crashes. Oh, sorry, my inner Star Trek geek is showing hard today. <laughs> so, think of this demo spacecraft as a kind of shuttle. But with the addition of this shuttle, it makes the spacecraft Starship a lot more like the International Space Station, with its own space lab platform and shipping and receiving department. <laughs> so, all of this is fine and good for stuff. But what about like my buddy Chris requested? How are we getting into space? Well, unveiled in this new Starship spacecraft manual are proposed new crew configurations. So SpaceX is saying today that it will be able to carry as many as a hundred people from Earth to both low Earth orbit and then onto the Moon and Mars. In this particular arena, SpaceX is also contending that the success of Starship and sending all of these people and stuff to space is based on what they call point-to-point -point transportation use. So. Basically, flying from one spaceport on Earth to another to cut down on travel time by making that trip through the edge of space. What? Oh my gosh! <laughs> okay, so what kind of travel accommodations are we talking about here? Well, this spacecraft manual does lay out some pretty sweet digs, including private cabins, 
solar storm shelters, of course, centralized storage, large common areas, and a viewing gallery. All right, sign me up. Or not, because folks, I get seasick just looking at a boat. Can you imagine me in space? (laughs) No. (laughs) So the Starship is still under development at that SpaceX Development Center in Boca Chica, Texas. But it has recently moved to the launch pad in advance of static fire testing. You know what that means, right? Yeah, we're getting a lot closer to this being a reality. So do you want to read that manual for yourself? Because I know you have time on your hands, and it is pretty cool. So I've included a link below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com. Go check it out. It's really cool. All right, let's keep going with our satellite loving theme this week and bring in Richard Janicki from Green Hill Software. Richard and I are talking about satellite security, satellite vulnerability, and more. Let's go. My guest today is Richard Janicki from Green Hill Software. Thank you so much for joining me, Richard. Thank you for having me here. Okay, so you presented a session at ETT this year where you outlined several worst case scenarios for security in our satellites. So let's first start on how we depend on satellites. What exactly are we looking at here? There's a lot of different ways we depend on them, right? That's right. There's many types of satellites. There's our GPS satellites, there's weather satellites, there's communication satellites, there's all sorts of types of imaging satellites. And really we've become to depend upon them, especially the GPS satellites for not only our navigation, but the specific timing that's needed for financial transactions, for controlling power grids, and even internet communication. The weather and the imaging satellites go across many industries, but agriculture for one is really dependent these days on the accurate imaging of soil content to know how much fertilizer to put down as an example. So it would really upend the industry if you didn't have those satellites available. Okay, so let's talk about the vulnerability of those satellites. Now, there is a an idea out there that satellites are not hackable or they're, uh, they're too old to be bothered with, but you're not seeing that, right? How are they attacked? So satellites have a lot of vulnerabilities from cyber attacks. They have physical vulnerabilities and electromechanical vulnerabilities, but there's cyber is the big one to worry about these days. And you can attack a satellite from its ground station, from its control center or the satellite directly. Even spoofing the ground station isn't that hard these days because you can buy a high quality satellite dish antenna for only a couple hundred dollars. So you have the ability to go and try and communicate with a satellite and you just have to hack into it. And there have been lots of successful hacks on satellites going back 20 years when the Russians hacked into Goddard and got a, the Rosat satellite to turn towards the sun and blind itself. So how can we fix this? What solutions should we really be looking at here? Well, satellites are really computers so that you can use a lot of good computer security. Some of the newer thoughts on what you might want is not to have a firewall, but really assume that somebody can get in if they try hard enough and you have intrusion detection, and then you try and make sure that they don't do harm when they get in. And at the beginning, the heart of that is isolation and separation so that any application cannot negatively affect or affect at all some other application. So even if you got some malware stuck in there, it wouldn't be able to go anywhere and affect another application. It would only be able to affect the entry point that it found and not really spread. So you mentioned a key here is satellite resilience. So break that down for me. What exactly do you mean by that? So the idea behind resilience is that you want to be able to, as a system, function even in spite of having some parts not working properly or disabled. So that if you think of a system, you could be the GPS satellite system. 
So if somebody took out one satellite, you have other GPS satellites in the area. That's the concept of distribution or proliferation is part of resilience is one of the key ideas behind resilience or ways to achieve resilience. Another one is disaggregation where you take one satellite that has lots of sensors, a big monolithic satellite, and break it into smaller satellites that if you took out one of them, you wouldn't lose all your sensors. Then there's being able to use alternate methods so that if you couldn't get access to our GPS system, if you were compatible with the European version, then you could actually access those GPS satellites instead if we had a GPS system failure. And then there's basic protections. You want to use encryption and you want to have maybe electromagnetic hardening. Those are the main components of resilience. All right, Richard, it is time for your off the cuff question. Now you have one person to have dinner with tonight. They could be living or dead. Who would it be? That's interesting. I'm a foodie, so I might choose uh, a chef. And uh, I've always really admired Julia Child. So I think I might pick her and see what we could cook up together. (laughs) Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me yet again, Richard. It's always a pleasure speaking with you. It's been great speaking with you too, Amelia. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you want to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, sure, I get it. You can follow us on LinkedIn as well. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular long-running Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by yours truly. And you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Fry In page, you can check out the Fish Fry archive or subscribe to Fish Fry via the iTunes Store or Spotify. And remember, if you want any further information about the stories covered in today's show, just head on over to eejournal.com and look for this week's Fish Fry In page. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology, any fun EE conference coming up, Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology, even if your company makes it, that's totally fine. Shoot me a line at Amelia at eejournal.com or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of April 3rd, 2020, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried. <laughs>